I'll talk today about OCT for structure and progression analysis. And OCT has different goals in new patients versus return patients. And I find it to be generally most useful in new patients where it can tell us whether glaucoma is present. And it can also tell us, more importantly, are we sure that there's not any glaucoma? I think we often talk about the additional false positives that OCT creates. But I think if the test is used correctly, it can often allow us to discharge somebody who doesn't need to be followed for glaucoma as well. And I think to some extent it could tell us how severe the disease is. So OCT is extremely helpful in new patients. A normal scan tells us that it's very unlikely there's new glaucoma, and it's a very good test at separating the physiological cupping from early glaucoma. So we heard some, uh, some information about how we should be evaluating the optic nerve. But I think pretty much when you see an abnormal optic nerve, it's extremely helpful to get an OCT. Whereas our clinical exam is, clinical, is critical for finding those people who may have glaucoma, the OCT does a much better job of confirming, or in some cases, rejecting that initial hypothesis. It can also identify people who have glaucoma very early. This may not be the most important thing, but it does tell us that those people at least need to be followed and oftentimes treated. So even in a high-risk patient, a normal OCT almost always rules out glaucoma. This is a nice study done by Rajal Parikh, which found that uh, at a 5% prevalence for glaucoma, if you look at the average glaucoma thickness, um, if you have a negative scan, the negative predictive value, meaning that the likelihood that that person really does not have glaucoma is 98%. So in somebody who you're not really sure they have glaucoma, or if in a random population-based study you just managed to pick somebody up and they had a negative scan, it's almost certain that that person really does not have glaucoma. Even if you're getting somebody who's a glaucoma suspect and a fairly significant glaucoma suspect, say that somebody who might, you might guess has about a one in three chance of having glaucoma, 30% prevalence, even that individual, if they have a negative scan, uh, the, negative, the predictive value of that negative scan is 85%, so it's very strong. So if somebody has a normal scan on an OCT, it's almost certain that they don't have glaucoma. There are several OCT parameters which are very specific and sensitive for glaucoma, meaning that if it says you have glaucoma, it's very likely that you do. So this is a study done by Don Budenz's group, which look, again looks at average nerve fiber layer thickness, and it's measuring sensitivity against one minus specificity. Generally, a test which is very good will have a very strong area under the curve. In other words, it'll really hug the boundaries of this curve. And you can see that it does so very, very well in moderate and severe glaucoma, so it can almost pick up everybody who clearly has the disease. Even in people who have very early glaucoma, it does a pretty good job with an AUC of, uh, of around 0 0.9, which is a still a very, very strong number. Um, I think even in people who have preperimetric glaucoma, meaning that they have a normal visual field, OCT can often find that that individual has glaucoma pretty well. This was a very nice study done with the UCSD group with um, Bob Weinreb and uh, Felipe Medeiros, where they actually took people who had preperimetric glaucoma. So these are individuals who had progressed on color photographs, uh, but they still had normal visual fields. And they looked at how likely or how well did OCT uh, differentiate those individuals from people who didn't have any progression. And again, they find that the uh, area under the curve is uh, about 0 0.9. So it really does a very good job even these people who have a normal visual field, but clearly in this case have glaucoma, based on the fact that they had disc progression. Uh, so you can also interpret an OCT test to decide if glaucoma is present or not. And I think this has a few different steps. The first step is, is the test, act, test result actually believable? So is this a test that you're going to uh, go ahead and further interpret to decide whether there's glaucoma present or not? And you're going to want to look at reliability measures. And you're also going to want to consider some features of the scan. And uh, you're also then going to ask, is the test abnormal? So once you say that I, this is a test that I believe, do you believe that it indicates that there's any pathology? And I do that primarily using global measures, secondarily using regional findings, and finally using inter-eye comparisons between the right and the left eye. So let's talk some about reliability measures first. So I think the best reliability measure is signal strength. And this is the one that I think that most people look at. It's right at the top of the scan, so you can't miss it. So it shows up. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm showing you mostly things from our Zeiss machine, which is this is what we use. But I think other instruments have similar findings as well. So you can see that right up at the top, they have a signal strength in this box over here, indicating it's 7 out of 10 in the right eye, 10 out of 10 in the left eye. Every machine is a little bit different, but generally things that are 7 out of 10 or 70 out of 100 are generally pretty good. 
once you start getting down to 50 is probably the limit at which you could really trust things very much at all. And below that, it becomes fairly unreliable. This is a very nice study from Harsha Rao uh, that was published a few years ago, which actually looks at how predictive a test is based on the level of severity on the visual field test, as well as what the uh, signal strength was. So if you look uh, over here, in, in scans that had low signal strength, their ability to differentiate normals from various levels of glaucoma was much poorer than eyes that had high signal strength. So once you have a high signal strength, that's a test to which can do a much, much better job. And a low signal strength test is not, uh, ir not uh, useless, especially in people who have moderate advanced disease, but especially in early disease, it's something which you just can't believe very much. I think we don't consider this a reliability factor, but we really ought to, and that's axial length. So this is a uh, plot of retinal nerve fiber layer thickness against axial length. And so you can see that as axial length becomes larger, retinal layer, uh, nerve fiber layer thickness becomes uh, thinner. And these are in people who have normal visual fields and no other evidence of glaucoma. However, this is not really a true effect. So if you actually adjust for the magnification effects that OCT is doing, you actually don't see any relationship anymore. So it's really a flat curve at this point in time. So what you think of as more and more thinning with increasing myopia is not really true. It's just a magnification effect from the optics of the machine. So what about the specific scan features? Certainly, there's several features of the scan that also can in that indicate that a scan is something which you shouldn't believe. So is there a of thickness from edema, especially in diabetics or uveitics? Uh, are there segmentation errors? This is probably the most common error that we see. And um, do we see that the peaks of nerve fiber layer thickness are not quite where we'd expect them to be? So certainly other conditions can produce retinal edema that mask nerve, retinal nerve fiber layer loss. This is a 61-year-old uveitic male who had retinal edema in the left eye, but severe IOP elevation for several weeks or months uh, from steroid therapy. And as you can see, uh, his actual thickness in the left eye is much higher than in the right eye. But then you can see his nerve fiber layer thickness peak, especially inferiorly, is much greater than average. So probably he has some edema in that area, which is affecting the thickness artifactually. And this shows it over here. And in fact, you can see his edema on the, uh, on the color image as well. So segmentation, is, as I mentioned, errors are, as I mentioned before, are the most common reason for artifact. And typically what you'll see is that the, the scan is actually trying to determine in the lower left and lower right hand area, uh, where is the area of retinal nerve fiber layer thickness. But if the scan is not of a high quality, it can't distinguish where those different errors are. Unfortunately, in the Zeiss machine, you have a hard time really figuring out from these scans whether or not there's a segmentation error because this little picture is so small that you can't really make it out. Other manufacturers will show that to you in much greater detail so you can actually see the segmentation error on the, uh, on, within the different layers of the retina shown in that picture. So if you, have a ret if you don't really segment properly, the most common error is that actually the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness is shown as zero. And in the, and in the uh, color plot over here, that's actually shown as black. So you can see that on the uh, thickness map uh, you could also see it on the uh, deviation map. And so you'll see a very severe deviation in that area over here because everything uh, couldn't be segmented. Everything is shown as being severely abnormal. And over here, again, the areas that are not being segmented are shown to be highly deviant from normal because, of course, the thickness of zero is being interpreted as, as being deviant from normal, although it really means that it just wasn't able to be segmented at all. Uh, it, can across, it can cross this TSNIT circle, which is the circle around the optic nerve head. Uh, which is then interpreted. And then you can actually see the thickness again is going to zero in that location where there was a segmentation error. You can also get focal segmentation errors. So this is a patient who had a uh, posterior vitreous detachment, shown as a small black circle over here. And that uh, small black area actually intersects the uh, TSNIT circle, which is drawn here in the deviation map. And so you can see an abnormal area over there. You can see that the uh, thickness goes to zero in the T-SNIT plot. And you can also see that the superior quadrant is erroneously called as being abnormal. Finally, we are inferring where the peak thicknesses of ganglion cell axons should be based on the Garway-Heath map. Uh, Ted Garway-Heath, uh, almost 20 years ago now, looked at where nerve fiber layer defects inter inserted into the optic nerve head and generated a map where, uh, which, which creates a correspondence between the edges of the optic nerve head and areas within the visual field. 
Unfortunately, myopia tends to move these RNFL thicknesses temporally, and you can see that in this situation over here, where now these peaks are moved off to the temporal side. And in some cases, you'll see them moved off to the nasal side as well. And now uh, the actual tissue is not where you would quite expect it, and therefore something can look abnormally thick or abnormally thin, not because there's more or less tissue, but just because where that tissue is coming to the optic nerve head is not where the machine expects it to. So finally, let's talk about whether the test is normal. I think the first way is global measures, uh, the next is regional measures, and the final is asymmetry. Global measures I find to be uh, the most useful. We should keep in mind that thicknesses are not absolute, so they're not the same across machines. Uh, this also decreases with age. And I use total thickness as a good gauge. So if somebody is in, on the Zeiss machine in the 90s or in the mid-80s, uh, they almost certainly have no glaucoma. Once they get to the upper 70s, they are, have possible glaucoma. Once they're in the low 70s, they probably have early glaucoma, and beyond that, they have moderate or severe glaucoma. What about regional findings? Certainly, oftentimes, glaucoma is localized to one pole, as seen in the right eye of the scan, both on the thickness map, the deviation map, the TSNIT plot, where then, um, the right eye is less than that of the left eye, as well as the quadrant analysis. Finally, I like to really compare thicknesses between the two eyes. They can be a little bit different, even as much as 10 microns, as shown by Don Budenz and colleagues. But normalized will tend to, will normalize will tend to have a very symmetric um, uh, circular plot on the TSNIT plot. And you can see that in all these eyes, where these two almost overlie each other perfectly. When you see that pattern, and things are in all flat, it's a very good sign that the eye is normal. When you have intra-eye symmetry, that suggests glaucoma. This could be in, in um, both poles, as shown over here, where one eye has significantly less thickness than the other. Uh, or you can see it sometimes just in one pole, where, for example, over here, uh, superiorly the two eyes are similar, but inferiorly there's quite a substantial difference, which almost very, very strongly indicates that there really is glaucoma. In return patients, we really want to talk about uh, the risk of disease worsening against the risk of therapy, and there's certainly numerous factors which help us decide this. But the best way to look at this is to look at uh, uh, test, uh, a series of tests. Looking at only a couple of tests is very difficult to detect whether there's progression, because definitely, generally the variability between tests is about four microns for total thickness and eight for just sector. So it's going to be hard on um, two tests to really be sure there's going to have to be a very substantial degree of progression. The best way to judge progression is on GPA. It'll actually show you color coatings of something which is possibly worse or definitely worse. You really want to uh, pay attention to the total thickness or the regional thicknesses in particular. Um, and the other areas tend not to be so useful. You can get pseudo worsening as a result of worse signal strength. This is a 22-year-old who had a DSEC which was becoming slightly cloudy, and the signal strength was decreasing. And you could see a great, uh, even while the pressure was controlled, and you could see a great uh, degree of worsening, even though everything was relatively stable. And you can see her visual field has remained stable, even though the OCT went from a very normal range to a significantly abnormal range. You could also look at change in the uh, change plots shown over here. You can look at this, the curves. You could look at whether uh, there's a significant areas where it gets significantly worse, shown here in orange or red. And it'll also highlight it in the lower left-hand side, where it'll highlight areas which are worse from the baseline. So I will rarely advance therapy based on OCT progression alone. I really look for visual field confirmation. In early disease, I will advance if there's other factors which suggest that things really aren't getting worse. Uh, for example, poor IOP control, poor adherence, other strong risk factors. You have to keep in mind that total thickness won't drop about, below about 50 to 60 microns. And so even with many tests, you can only really judge progression if there's at least five microns of change or 10 microns in the superior or inferior quadrants. And so really, continued testing has little value once you even get to a mild or moderate stage. Um, so OCT is very good, uh, but you think you're, it's very good in new patients, especially those with suspected glaucoma, where you can rule it in or rule it out. You can help judge progression, uh, particularly in very early disease, although you want to integrate this information with other clinical tests. And there's very minimal utility, especially for nerve layer thickness in moderate or severe disease. Some of you may start using macular OCT, and I think I won't talk about it much today. It's a little bit different, and that may have some useful utility in, moder in uh, measuring progression in more advanced disease, uh, although I find that it tends to have a lot of artifacts in early disease, and it may not be quite as useful in those suspect eyes. Thank you. <laughs>